There's just a plethora of, I was able to make a comic in 20 minutes. You, you all can do it too, they're everywhere. There's great ones, there's horrible ones too. Um, but they're everywhere. So, improve and develop critical literacy. There's lots written about critical literacy. I'm not gonna go into it as much, but think of literacy simply being able to read. Critical literacy, reading between the lines, looking at the historical information in there, look at the representation, who are the characters, who's telling the story, making the jumps between panels. This is, think of reading between the lines. You're reading a novel and you're supposed to find out what's going on, what does this symbolize? Comics is another thing that really helps with this. You have pictures and you have to make lots of jumps from what's going on in the written, what's going on from one panel to the next. Um, there's a huge interplay of why is there one panel, why are there 10 panels together, what are we focusing on? Um, I, this was obviously cut off, so I'll read the quote to you. This was my transferring from a keynote on Mac to a PowerPoint, my, my fear of what might happen. So I'll read you the nice quote there. Um, so reaching readers at multiple, am I on the right one now? Yeah. Reach, reaching readers at multiple reading levels while still attending to salient social, cultural, and historical issues. That's what the second one says, I promise. Um, so the importance of this and the ability to bring in social issues, to bring in cultural issues, um, to look at history through comics. Comics and trauma. I promise I'll finish with the quote soon because then we'll look at a bunch of pretty pictures. Um, comics and trauma. Comics can express life stories, especially traumatic ones, powerfully because it makes literal the presence of the past by disrupting spatial and temporal conventions to overlay or palimpsest uh, past and present. And that is something that's done really well in comics and Jay touched on this as well where you can go back and forth and how we naturally go back and forth. And if there are just words, this is a lot more difficult. This is also why we retain a lot more of things when we're reading comics or when we're doing education where we're just reading something. You're just listening versus listening and writing notes if there's pictures or not. All right, so here's my first example. I'll take this, I'll let you look at this while I grab my water. So this is a, a wonderful comic that I found. I was so happy to find this comic a few years ago. <clears throat> this is the first one I'm gonna tell, show you how we can use this. So this first one, historical contextualization. So this is a comic from 1954, The H-Bomb and You. What a, what a great title here. Now what can we learn from this? Well, in 1954, they were concerned about H-Bombs. They also gave really bad advice on how to survive them. Apparently, if you built a piece of wood, put a piece of plywood against your wall and crawled in behind it, you were good. Um, thankfully, we know that's not true and wouldn't try to do that. Um, if you're lucky, you had a hole in the ground. I, I guess that's the other thing they're trying to tell us. But it shows us what they were concerned about at the time, what was going on at the time. We're looking post-World War II, we're looking going into the Cold War. So we can look at this from a historical point of view and see what's going on. Now there's another side to this that I think when I, I first found this comic that many people overlooked. They were shocked by the H-bomb and basically making a lean-to to survive the effects of the H-bomb. The more interesting thing, and this comes at least in my studies, is the genderization of this whole thing. So, if you are a man, here's what your job is. There are many ways your father can help. He can join the ground uh, over observer corps. He can help people. He can build your lean-to that's not gonna do anything for you in your basement. Um, this is what the father can do. Now, if we look at this to the next thing, the first sentence to me, from someone that's doing stuff with gender studies and queer studies, is extremely problematic. The first words, you girls. So we've already taken away from the father, the man, and we've made it diminutive to girls. They're not women, they're girls. Now what do the girls get to do? 
Well, you can help at welfare centers, you can clean things, you can register people, um, you can help out, you can even take an, a nursing course. Th this is the idea, and so from one, we're looking at the change in the idea of gender, how this comic would be written today, and I guess it ch depends on where we're having this comic written, but if we're looking at the 50s, we can go, wow, this is exactly what was published and what people thought, and these were gender roles that we had at the time. The father was building stuff and going on saving people. The mom was in, in the one before you can uh, see. She's also taking out the trash, of course, um, and doing cooking and ironing things. Uh, what the roles are, and I think this comparison is really nice as well to look at for this historical context. Um, here's a great graphic novel comic I found uh, just recently. Um, I use comics a lot in my history course that I teach. And this one was published shortly, about two years after the Montgomery bus boycotts. And I thought it was a brilliant and very brave thing at the time that they would use this to bring children, educate children, about what was going on, about discrimination, about inequality in the South, and why there is a Montgomery bus boycott, why there were sit-ins. It's absolutely wonderful. I show this one um, in a social movements course, along with, absolutely cannot recommend enough, uh, March by John Lewis. Um, the two of those are really interesting to see next to each other. Superman. Now here's a recent one, and I love this example. Has anyone seen this? No? One, one person? Anyone heard about this? People got really pissed off at Superman recently. Does anyone know why? Well, this guy on the right here comes in with a gun and is yelling at all the immigrants and they're taking his job. And he's about to unload and fire on all of them and Superman jumps in front of them and saves them. Good on Superman. Um, now what happened afterwards, and this might have been innocuous and forgotten, but some news outlets got a hold of this and started attacking Superman. And how can Superman do this? I remember when Superman was all American and stood for American values. How dare he protect people? Um, yeah, irony is deep there. Now, the person went on one step further and said, and he's an immigrant. Um, true. He is indeed an immigrant, but I remember when he used to be the all-American person. This is a comic from the 1950s with Superman in it. So let's see if Superman's ideas have changed. 1950s, 2017. And remember, boys and girls, your school, like our country, is made up of Americans of many different races, religions, and national origins. So. If you hear anybody, anybody talk against a schoolmate or anyone else because of his religion, race, or national origin, don't wait. Tell him, that kind of talk is un-American. Help keep your school all American. Um, I don't think the people that were yelling about Superman realize the historical back part of Superman or the fact that Superman is definitely an immigrant. Um, Later on in one of the issues, Superman talks about uh, giving up his citizenship because it's, uh, he doesn't feel he's an American and accepted anymore, which I thought was another step. But uh, the historical aspect here with this happening in the 50s, with comics being used now as politics as well is really interesting and in what people's reactions to them are. So it's not someone writing an article in the New Yorker and Fox News is attacking it. It's now they're mad about Superman and what's being said in comics. So it was both disturbing for me and also gave, for me, a legitimacy to comics. It proved that people that want to complain about these things are actually reading comics. So I was kind of torn between being happy about this and being sad. All right, so um, again, this is a cut off slightly at the top, but looking at historical perspectives. So as I said, I teach some uh, kind of history courses and I use lots of comics. And 
And one of the ones I like to use, um, I use a book called Howard Zinn, A People's History of the United States, 1492 to Present. The sim it's a massive tome of a book. I wouldn't recommend trying to read it straight through. I think it's like 800 pages long. Um, but it is a wonderful book. However, someone made a graphic novel of it, which is brilliant. Now, what a people's history does, it says, well, you've been taught all this history all your life, but a lot of it is wrong. Or it's one perspective. Now, who has throughout history had the chance to tell history? People with money and power. The people who won the wars. Generally, in, uh, especially in literary studies, we say rich white men. That's who's got to tell all the stories. So what Howard Zinn did is went through and got all the stories of people whose voices weren't heard before. And here's one example from this graphic novel and talking about the Wounded Knee Massacre. Now, Wounded Knee Massacre was this horrific event. Um, basically, the soldiers came in, fired on largely unarmed uh, Native Americans, slaughtered them. Few of the uh, soldiers were killed basically by crossfire, um, and then it was kind of forgotten about. They did all kinds of horrific things. I don't know if you can see the pictures here. Um, people were paid $2 a body to bury the bodies. Now, by burying the bodies, they dug a massive ditch. This was a mass grave uh, that they built. And here is uh, Black Elk, one of the leaders, and he's talking about what happened that day and how much they lost that day. And now, not just telling the history, is telling the story of this. We've all heard, okay, people moved west and many people were killed. And that's generally where it ends. Or we hear about the Trail of Tears. Now, what I like to do is not just talk about this from the historical aspect and show um, what happened that day, but I also want to bring this into a current events context. And this is where I like to contextualize it with current events in the US. So this is the end of, this is one of the chapters in the Howard Zinn book. And the, here's what he says in this at the end. I did not know then how much was ended. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, I can still see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered all along the crooked gulch, as plain as when I saw them with my eyes still young. And I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream. And this combined with the pictures, both the, the graphic pictures and the actual pictures of the time, I think is a very powerful image to bring in what's going on. But still, some people might forget about this and think, well, this happened hundreds of years ago. This is, we're different now. We've moved past that. And I juxtapose this with a graphic novel by um, Joe Sacco. This quote is the first quote that appears in a graphic novel by Joe Sacco called Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. And the first picture you have in there is this. This is where Wounded Knee took place, the Pine Ridge Reservation. Now, the Pine Ridge Reservation today is a place of extreme poverty. No alcohol is allowed on uh, Indian reservations. But just over the border, there's a town with a population of 14 people. In this town of 14 people, there are three liquor stores that do several million dollars a year in sales. And these are taken from, if you do a Google Earth picture, I did that in one of my other presentations, you could actually see some people hanging out at these, um, these liquor stores. 14 people has three liquor stores with several million dollars in sales. So you see the situation, what has happened over 150 years later from this Pine Ridge massacre is still going on today. The discrimination, the lack of social chances in Pine Ridge. Uh, it's in South Dakota. So I want to go back to this quote from this person before and give you my Archie example. Um, a good graphic novel is not an Archie in whatever her name was comic. As I said, I had used this two weeks before. It is mostly the end of the quotes. Now we get a look at pretty pictures. Um, so representation, one of my next points. So in this Archie comic, 
This is a very interesting thing. This is seen as one of the first actually using the words asexual in a comic. And I use this in a queer studies course. We're looking at representation. And asexuality is rather underrepresented in all forms of literature to the point of it actually being what we talk about is erasure. Um, this is what's happened in the past when I said rich white men telling stories. Many stories of Native Americans, of African Americans, women, um, Asian Americans were erased. It was this one story and this was a story for everyone. So in here I found this rather interesting as I said I read this round table two weeks after using this comic that not only is it pointed out that Archie is uh, asexual but it's, there's a joke made about it not about him being asexual but about the people who are not asexual. Um, he says uh, Jughead, sorry. I mean, look at Archie. Guy's losing his mind over Betty and what's her name so bad he can't even tie his shoes. Now, this is the problem of being uh, heterosexual for Archie. Uh, next one, and this Jay touched on this a bit, and I said elucidating complex theories. So, another side of an importance for comics and graphic novels. So, this just came out last year.